Good morning. Thank you for joining me for another five good minutes with the Word. I'm Barry Bryson. We're continuing our study of the Thessalonian correspondence, and we're jumping in uh, to the eschatological portion of this book today in the text. We're going to pick up with chapter 1, verse 5. I think last time I said chapter 5. There aren't five chapters in 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 5. And this eschatological portion really continues on through chapter 2, verse 12. It is the longest extended eschatological portion uh, uh, in Paul's writings. Uh, and he's writing it to a very young congregation, as we've continued to discuss. We've been studying the Thessalonian correspondence. So that makes it even more interesting to us, because he's talking to them about things he's already taught them about. And he was only with them for a few weeks. And so these topics were primary when he was planning a church. This consciousness of end times, that judgment is imminent. Um, just a note before we, um, uh, you know, um, um, hold our nose and jump into the pool so that we don't drown. Um, uh, let's remember that he's writing to answer their questions and concerns, not ours. Uh, as we read this section, we're going to bring questions to the text that are not questions he's going to directly answer, because they're our questions, not their questions. Um, their question back in 1 Thessalonians was, what happens to people who die before Jesus comes again? And his answer to them was, they're going to rise first and be reunited with Jesus first. They evidently have follow-up question or or. or residual issues uh, concerning the second coming um, and the meaning of it and the timing of it and how do you recognize the time. And um, he's going to be really kind of addressing that throughout the, the, the rest of the correspondence. But he's going to talk about something that has to happen before the second coming can occur. And it hasn't happened yet in, in their experience. So, um, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, we're going to just cover verses 5 through 10 today. This is a plain indication of God's righteous judgment, so that you may be considered worthy of the kingdom of God for which you indeed are suffering. For, after all, it is only just for God uh, to repay with affliction those who afflict you, and to give relief to you who are afflicted, and to us as well. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, dealing out retribution to those who do not know God and to those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. These will pay the penalty of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. When he comes to be glorified in his, saint, in his saints on that day, and to be marveled at among all who have believed, for our testimony to you was believed. The plain indication of God's righteousness is their suffering. We've already talked about how their suffering um, has had its uh, positive effect on their capacity to love and to serve and to be obedient. Because they have endured together and held on to each other together, they've been uh, able to grow and to be strong. It, it is only, they have absorbed the negative energy and it has produced a positive effect. But it's also accomplishing something else. It is evidence. It's a plain indication of judgment to come. That they're being considered worthy of the kingdom because they're suffering for the kingdom. And, and, and it will be made plain when Jesus comes again, what righteousness is and who the righteous are. And we have in these opening verses, this vivid, and by vivid I mean visual, this visual reminder of this day that they're looking forward to, a day when Jesus will come again, a day when they will, Jesus will be glorified in them. Did you notice that? He will be glorified in his saints, in verse 9. There are connections to several Old Testament passages here, uh, particularly in referring to 
um, the coming in flaming fire, judgment coming in flaming fire. The first reference we have to the flaming fire is in the book of Numbers chapter 11, and the last one is in Zephaniah chapter 3. And uh, there are countless between in between those two quotes. But he, he, he more specifically quotes Isaiah chapter 2, verses 10, 19, and 21 uh, in verse 9. Um, and he seems to be quoting from the Septuagint, not from the Hebrew version, which is interesting as well. Makes you think that maybe someone possessed a copy or had studied uh, that from that version uh, there at that congregation. It's just an, it's a really cool piece of um, of information, a little clue. Um, but but. Early on, he's saying, yes, the day is coming, the day is sure, and the day is going to be glorious, and you're going to see the glory of Jesus in it, and you're going to see Jesus glorify himself in you, through you, because of your faithfulness. And everybody's going to see, everybody's going to marvel, particularly those who have believed, and you're among those who have believed. So this is his introduction to reinforce the imminence of the day, the certainty of the day, um, and that it will be a day um, of, of judgment, a day when Jesus is going to be glorified, when there's not going to be a question about who the true power is and what truth is, because it's all going to be plain to everyone. Okay, we'll uh, end the first chapter next time. We're going to look at verses 11 and 12, and then we're going to take a moment to introduce chapter 2. Uh, before we enter into the text of chapter 2. Uh, thank you for joining me for another five good minutes. We'll pick up with verse 11 next time.